Okay, this uh, video is called Christmas Art. We'll see some beautiful paintings and talk about them just a little bit. Um, this is Wedding of the Virgin by Raphael. Uh, okay, I'm gonna take myself off the screen though now because I'm gonna wanna interfere with the paintings that are coming up. Okay, here's the Annunciation where the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary and lets her know what the plan is and she agrees to it. You can see the emotions so well portrayed here by Sandro Botticelli, 1490, and he was the favorite artist of the Medici. Him and van der Wieden were the two greatest artists of the 1400s. So beautiful, the painting and her emotions, how they're expressed by the hand gesture. Okay, here is the Immaculate Conception of Mary. There's the Holy Ghost right there. You can see her looking up at it, rather beautiful, by Piero di Cosimo in 1505. And that's the thing, you know, Christianity has produced more great art than anything ever in the history of the world. It has energized people to just have an incredible aesthetic sense. There is no other country, there's no other religion that's produced anywhere near the art of Christianity. If you know of any, please tell me. I would be happy to learn about it. It's magnificent. People like to make fun of Christianity, but they don't, you know, give it enough credit for all the great things that it has done. The metaphysics that it produces energize people, that life has meaning, the truth can be known, man is created in the image of God. All of these things lead to incredible artistic achievement, to beautiful things that are good. Okay, here is Annunciation and the Adoration of the, Ma the Magi by Roger van der Wieden. Him and Botticelli were the two best artists in the 1400s. They're magnificent. So, of course, here's the Annunciation. You can see this little Holy Ghost looks like Caspar the Ghost, and there's Mary praying. Um, and, of course, here's the baby Adoration of the Magi, the baptism over there. You should see his other paintings, too. He's an incredible artist, that guy. Not well known, either. Okay, here is Adoration of the Child by Gerhard von Holthorst. Um, and this is beautiful. The light, almost lights emanating from the baby, if you will. You can see the happiness and joy in their faces. It's just beautiful. And, and you know, these are all masterpieces, but there's a hundred great paintings for every masterpiece and a thousand good ones for every uh, great one. It's, it's an incredible amount of beautiful art has been created in the Christmas tradition and the Christian tradition. It's extraordinary. Okay, these paintings are both by William Bougereau. Um, and so the first one corresponds here, like the blue of the letters matches the blue of Mary's gown. And, you know, Mary, Queen of Heaven. And so it's just a beautiful picture. The angels are playing music for the Madonna and Child. It's just beautiful. And here it is, Innocence. And one can see the beautiful um, Mary with the baby and the lamb. I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. Okay. And here's Sandro Botticelli. Mom looks a little tired here with the baby with eight uh, angels with their lilies and uh, just another. Look how lifelike and beautiful that face is. It's like someone you know. Here's in more on Sandro Botticelli. This is called the Madonna Magnificat. And so all of this, you know, there was like a competition amongst the Renaissance artists to produce the best uh, paintings in the walls of all the different churches. A lot of the population was literate, so this was to educate the population and to entertain them. Um, and the competition led to many, many incredible improvements in art. And that's really where what we consider sort of uh, accurate, lifelike painting really developed. And that competition, I see something almost similar happening uh, on the internet now for nutrition and lectures about art in that, not art about nutrition, health, and pathophysiology because there's a competition to produce good material. And so that's leading to better work. Um, competition is a good thing. You know, an honest competition is a good thing. Okay, here's the Mystic Nativity by Sandro Botticelli. And we've talked about this before, the colors, just like the colors of my tie. You can't see it right now, but red, green, and white. So white for faith, green for hope, red for charity, for love. And that's the, the color of the gowns of the angels. There's the nativity scene. And again, the same thing with the angels. It's rather beautiful. Okay. And of course, there's a lot more to these paintings, but for now, we just want to uh, get to see them. You can certainly look them all up if you're more curious. 
Okay, so this is by Fra Filippo Lippe, 1459. Also a beautiful use of the art and three-dimensional uh, perspective and depth. They're just beautiful. And it's not just one artist. There's tons of great <laughs> Renaissance artists and other artists in the Catholic tradition. Okay, and most of it comes from Catholics. Protestants did a little bit of good stuff, especially the pre-Raphaelites in the 1800s. Um, this is another lovely uh, Sistine Madonna and Child by Raphael. These two angels down here, those became famous when they were on a Van Halen record cover. Here's the Holy Family. Uh, it's on a round picture. So the family, Don de Tondo, round, rotund. And, uh, you know, it was by Michelangelo. You know, he was obviously a great painter, even better sculptor. Uh, here's Pope Julius. And, you know, I like Pope Julius. He's the guy who sort of had the vision for the Renaissance to have the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel painted. He's the one who hired Raphael for the Stanza Signatura, who painted School of Athens and whatnot, and sort of a unified view of Christianity is good at accepting things. It can accept Greek philosophy and Greek learning and the Roman learning and whatnot. And so it's able to take things in, and, that, uh, and it welcomes everyone. So anyways, we have a gratitude for Pope Julius for having the vision that helped uh, the Renaissance to develop. Okay, so here's some wonderful paintings by Bartolome Murillo, sort of uh, from Spain, and they're just beautiful. So here's the concept of the heavenly trinity and the earthly trinity, and his faces, um, they're just so lifelike, and the expressions are great. Here's Our Lady with the Rosary. I mean, look at the faces on them. They're just beautiful. This is uh, Christ in the House of His Parents, um, and this is by John Everett Millay uh, from 1850. So he's one of the pre-Raphaelites. The pre-Raphaelites were the school promoted by John Ruskin, who said they were going to go back to the time of Raphael and before when they felt that art was more sincere. They felt that art had become more like adornment, a little bit too uh, commercialized in a sense, if you will, but more like they were just trying to emphasize the beauty of their technique rather than the thought that went into their scene and the piety, if you will. So anyway, it's a lovely painting. He was a fantastic artist, John Everett Millay. Him and the whole pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood were great. Okay, this is um, John Ruskin, and he is one of the leaders of the Renaissance movement in England during the Victorian age. And he was a brilliant guy, another crazy genius. And he had, you know, Presbyterian, you know, Calvinist almost, Scottish parents, and then he had the English Anglican culture in which he lived. He was a professor at Oxford. He helped educate uh, Oscar Wilde. He wasn't the most uh, pietetic, but uh, Oscar Wilde was also good. He's a lot more Catholic than people realize. But Ruskin tried to bring about a Gothic revival along with Augustus Pugin in the architecture in England in the, the mid-1800s and Cardinal John Henry Newman, who became a saint, um, and it was rather a magnificent, beautiful time. Uh, they did a lot of good things, and Charles Dickens was writing all the books at that time. It's like Christmas Carol is one of the greatest novels ever written. And here's an illustration from Christmas Carol of uh, Bob Cratchit with Tiny Tim. And this was by Harold Crobbin from around 1920. And so the unique thing, too, about this is, so you know the two versions of the story. Tiny Tim was headed towards dying, but because Scrooge sort of repented and began to appreciate life and other people, he helped Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim lives. It's a beautiful story. I actually think it's one of the best novels ever written. It's very easy to read, very fast. It's definitely the best book of Charles Dickens. It's, it's magnificent. The idea of redemption, forgiveness, and um, making things better. You know, Christian ethics make everybody welcome and give everybody a chance, and that's a great thing in this world. Okay, creation painting. You've all seen this one. Michelangelo, the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. And basically, man is created in the image of God. And because of that, he is entitled to natural rights because he's partly divine. And you really want that. If you don't have a biblical worldview of man created in the image of God, the default alternative tends to be atheistic Darwinism, whereby man is labeled as just being a talking primate, in which case he has no intrinsic rights. You know, primates are owned by, you know, the zookeeper, for example, or the research uh, person. Uh, so they have no rights. And so you don't want that. They're basically like livestock, like farm animals for whoever owns them. And that's what happens to humans once they have a society with no, um, without a biblical worldview or a similar view. Okay, here's God surrendering the dark from the light. Again, Michelangelo. And by the way, the science goes with uh, religion. 
Some people will try to argue otherwise, but just for what it's worth, I've studied the origin of life, the origin of the universe rather extensively, and I've got other lectures where I have all books on all that, but it's very good for a God-created universe. No one can explain it any other way. Okay, here's beautiful uh, sculpture of Michelangelo, the Pieta, just magnificent. This is the greatest sculpture ever in the history of the world. And once again, the Christian worldview energizes people and inspires great artistic achievement. You know, in school, kids become stupid because they get told everything is equal. It is not true. Not everything is equal. No other religion or culture has ever been able to produce this quality of art. If you're aware of it and you know otherwise, please show me. I'd be happy to see it. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but I doubt it. I've, I've studied art a long time. This is magnificent, this sculpture. It's beyond good. It's, it's like unbelievable a, a human could make something so beautiful, so great. And I think people should treasure all this art and what Christianity has done in Christian, Christian ethics because... You know, you're at risk to lose it. And if you lose it, you'd be surprised. Take a look at life in these other countries where they don't have a biblical worldview, okay? The people have no rights. They have no, they have no expectation of being treated kindly or fairly. Uh, so you don't want that. Here's the Open Bible by Vincent van Gogh. And, you know, a lot can be learned from the Bible. You know, you, you learn the stories when you're young, and that helps create a worldview that enables you to think better. You know, a person becomes smart from reading and thinking as part of it and having conversations about that. And that would make kids a lot smarter. They should learn this in school because ignorance of the Bible makes you unable to read English literature effectively. Okay, here's a painting by August Friedrich Schenk from 1873. It's called Lost. And to me, this is kind of a, like a modern America in the sense that the sheep are in a storm. And you try to rally them to the cross, a hope where they can, you know, stick together and help each other. But, you know, the dogs will do what they can to help them, but the dogs can only do so much. And so basically they either, you know, rally to the cross and try to help each other and have a decent life. Otherwise, they're going to be out in the field, cold, picked off by the wolves one by one with no hope of making it. So... Anyways, magnificent painting. He's got other good paintings, this guy. He paints sheep and create all kinds of incredible uh, emotional dramas that a human can relate to. So hopefully America and other countries will recognize the good things that they have and try to maintain health and freedom and a good life rather than end up being treated like talking primates. That's what you don't want. And don't let anybody tell you religious people aren't smart. There's a tendency in popular culture to try to say, oh, religious people are stupid. No, the smartest person who ever lived, Isaac Newton, was one of the most religious people who ever lived. Go take a look at James Tour, the PhD, one of the smartest people alive on the planet today. He's as religious as, I, as uh, Isaac Newton was, okay? Um, Isaac Newton in 1665 went to the family cottage out in Woolsthorpe. And that's when he had his Anno Mirabilis, the miracle year, where he basically figured out calculus and gravity and optics and a bunch of other stuff just working on his own. Okay, so rather incredible. And science comes from Christianity. If you study the history of science, you will see that as the case. It did not arise in the non-Christian countries. It arose modern version of what we consider science with generation of a hypothesis followed by experimentation, analysis of the hypothesis, and future experience. That's the scientific, modern scientific method, and that came from uh, Christian populations, okay? All right, freedom of speech is just pretty routine in Christianity. Uh, there's a few, well, we don't need to get into all the detail of it. This is a nice painting by uh, Norman Rockwell, and that's important. You need that to do good scientific work, to do good work in any subject. Okay, Christianity produced the greatest architecture in the history of the world with the cathedrals. They're the most beautiful buildings in the world by far, okay? And the ones in France are a lot nicer. I just got this painting of Salisbury Cathedral in England by John Constable, but the ones in France are, are actually much better. They got much more statuary on the outside, much more paintings on the inside. They're magnificent. <laughs> you know, the high ceiling is sort of looking up towards God, like a forest canopy. It's beautiful, okay? And uh, the piety and the respect for older people, all of this is good. You know, the Christianity celebrates the family, and you, you have to celebrate the family if you want a society to survive. If you don't celebrate the family, then, you know, your society is going to go extinct. So this is a beautiful picture. It looks like a Thanksgiving dinner. Of course, we'd prefer a vegan entree, but it's still wonderful. Another painting here by Norman Rockwell. 
And here's a painting. Um, it's called Filial Piety, so family piety. And the other subtitle of it is The Paralytic. So the father is paralyzed here, and one can see how all the family is helping to take care of him. This is by Jean-Baptiste Grueza from 1763. And so the beauty of this painting, it just goes to show how having social support, without social support, this guy would be dead, okay? With social support, he might live for quite a while. Um, so it's a nice example of the family helping each other, and I think it's a beautiful painting. And we see that being characteristic of people who live a long, uh, healthy life, is that they have family support. You can look up the Rosetto effect, too. When families stick together and help each other, they are so much better off, and they live longer and healthier, regardless of all the other circumstances, you know, with demographically matched populations, they much outlive them and are much healthier. Um, the Rosetto effect, again, is a good example of that. Um, and, you know, there's a freedom in the family. You can talk openly with your family members. Um, Edmund Burke, the member of parliament from England, had said, you know, the family is the platoon of freedom. And, you know, you want to cherish the family and support the family. And don't take it for granted that you... Um, have a right to have a family. If you look at slavery, they didn't necessarily get to have families. I know about slavery from my ancestors in uh, in Ireland, okay, and it's been the same problem in other slavery populations. There's no reason to think that won't come back. So we should be grateful for families and cherish them. And if there is no Christian or biblical worldview God, then no one has a right to a family. You're just a farm animal owned by a ruler. So it's important to remember that because cherish something or it could be lost. Here's just a painting of Thomas Kincaid. He's one of the greatest painters of Christmas scenes and family scenes and rural life. And he has tons more paintings like this. They're beautiful. I own several of his books. They're great. They're, he's like the best-selling painter of all time, this Thomas Kincaid. His nickname is the Painter of Light. Okay, so that's basically the last painting here. The light of the world knocks on the door. It's up to the person whether or not they answer, whether or not they want to keep freedom and Christianity in the world. Hopefully they will. Hopefully it will survive. Hopefully we'll have a new Christmas every year. Hopefully it won't turn into some secular, you know, mediocre thing, winter holiday or something like that. Let's be grateful for what we have. So Merry Christmas, everybody.